Welcome to the Atmosphere Church channel. On behalf of all of us here at Atmosphere, thank you for watching. We pray that this message will touch your heart and change your life. Regardless of what you believe, where you come from, or what questions you might have, you are welcome here. Our desire is to help lead you in experiencing God by following Jesus. If you want to find out more information about us, head over to our website at atmosphere.church. And don't forget to click below to subscribe. Enjoy the message. What's up, guys? How you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians 13. That's where we're going to be today. Uh, but hey, I'm, uh, I'm stoked to get to be up here this morning. Uh, you're typically probably used to me being up here with Josiah as an announcement guy. Um, and I was actually backstage to the announcements and Josiah was like, hey, we, or the speaker didn't show up. Can you get out there and do it? And so I happened to have something prepared and it all just worked out. But no, um, no, I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. I'm super excited. I'm super excited for this morning. Um, specifically, I'm really excited to talk about this passage, 1 Corinthians 13, because I think this is something, you know, I'm sharing with you and, and we're teaching, but, but really this is something that as I prepared for this and just in general with my life is something that is a huge part of my story, is a huge part of what speaks to my soul and, and into my relationship with Jesus. So again, super excited. But hey, as a church, if you've been here the past, it's like eight, nine, whatever, we, I, don't, I guess it's 13, but past 12 weeks, um, we've been going through um, the book of 1 Corinthians. And it's through a series called Messy Grace. And 1 Corinthians is this letter from the Apostle Paul to a church in Corinth. And Corinth is in Greece. And Corinth at the time, and even still is, um, booming metropolis for culture and, and all these different things. And kind of a fun fact about the way that the Apostle Paul would do his ministry is that if he were, for example, if he were to be doing ministry in, in the United States today, he would go to places like Los Angeles and he would go to places like New York or Nashville. He would go to uh, like the hub of culture. There's some states he would not go to. I'm not going to mention those states to offend you if you're from those states, but there's some states he would, he would go to places that he knew that it would have the greatest impact, that he could, you know, plant a church there and what would happen there would flow outward. And so uh, the church of Corinth is a young church, a lot like we're a young church here at Atmosphere, and they've got some issues. They've got some stuff going on. There's some, some messiness within the church. Um, I got to actually go to Greece this past summer, uh, which was awesome. And I got to go to some of the places that Paul preached, one of them being Mars Hill. Uh, if you're familiar with Paul's sermon in Acts chapter 17 at Mars Hill and see some of these things, it's kind of funny. You go to these other countries and they have their history and they put a bulletproof case around it and they keep it protected in America. We just don't care. We just bulldoze it and it's gone and we build a building. No, just kidding. That's my rant as a history guy. There's all of this history in these other countries, but I, I wish we had more here. Okay. Anyway, moving on. You're like, what is he even talking about? Um, so a lot of the issues that Paul is addressing in the church of Corinth uh, are, are relevant today in 2023 in the church here in America and the church across the world. And so, you know, last week, if you were here, we were in 1 Corinthians 12. If you weren't here, I'll kind of summarize it for you, bring you up to speed. But uh, Pastor Jim talked about the spiritual gifts that, that Paul lists in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it's this idea that when we say yes to following Jesus, when we step into a personal relationship with Jesus, we get the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus living on the inside of us and that, that changes who we are. It changes our nature and our, and our literal being. And you know, I'll say this, that 
we can go to church um, and we can do Christian things and we can kind of help our outward appearance But if we want real life change, if we want our heart to change, our desires to change, our thoughts to change, not just our actions, but but what's inside of us, it takes the Holy Spirit. It takes inviting Jesus in. It takes that personal relationship with Jesus to really change our lives, change who we are, and change our nature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. And that's what is happening when we step into a relationship with Jesus. And Pastor Jim talked about how those, as, a, as the Holy Spirit comes into our heart, there's these spiritual gifts that we might get. And so in um, last, this past Saturday was our serve day. Anyone here that was a part of serve day got to be at the serve day? I see some of you guys that I was with. Um, it was super special. And serve day is an opportunity for us as believers to step into our gifting. It's an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to manifest into our lives, for us to step into our gifting, for us to do things that we don't typically do, that we would actually see, man, the Lord actually wants to use me in a way that I never imagined, right? So often in our lives, I mean, we're we're busy. There's a day-to-day struggle. There's the day-to-day grind. There's, you know, work, school, kids, all these different things. And we, we sometimes... Even, even those, if you've been following the Lord for a long time, we sometimes have these giftings that we're aware of and we kind of store them up. We stop using them as much. We stop making space for Jesus to work in our lives. Uh, and, and we see it happen in our lives. I know it happens in my life. And, but also there's the other side of it where you could step out in a serve day. And I've seen this in, in my life and people's lives where they step out in a serve day or something like it where you are forced to kind of be uncomfortable, right? Serve day, anyone be unco- is uncomfortable on serve day sometimes, right? Like you have to step out and talk to people and do things you don't normally do. And you, you, might, you might just realize that you're gifted in a way that changes the entire trajectory of your life. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that, right? If you didn't make space for the Holy Spirit to manifest in your life, to put on display the gifting that the Lord has put within you. And so that's what we talked about. Uh, that's what we talked about last week. And did anyone get to, last week or in the past, anyone to do any of the gas station serve projects? Anyone in here done the gas station? Okay, let's go. Let's go. Okay. Hey, so I got to, do, I didn't do that this past time. I got to do that before. Gas station is like, man, that's the best one. That's the easiest one. I mean, even the meanest person, you go up to someone, I mean, they hate you. They hate every Christian and they hate all churches. But when you pay for their gas, you're, they're crying and you're giving them a hug by the end of it, right? Like <laughs> the gas station is my favorite. I love that one. And so I've got to do that uh, last, not this last one, but like I said, a couple times ago. And it's so much fun. But for those of you that have have been a part of Serve Day and done, obviously, not just the gas station, but these other ones. Maybe you pay for someone's meals or whatever you're doing. What, what is a question that you get asked when you serve someone? What, what do they ask you? Why? Why are you doing that? Why? What in, in financial times like this, why could you possibly want to fill up my F-350? Why would you ever do that, right? And it's like, and you answer them. You go, I don't know. You know, it's not my money. But no, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, the, the answer, you know, we like, we love you. We, we love Jesus. We want to show you the love of Jesus. We want to do these types of things. Or we have, you know, our saying as a church, right? We show no strings attached, Jesus style love. And I want to, I want to hang on to that phrase of Jesus style love. We're going to come back to that. But those are, that's kind of our, our answer uh, that we give to people. And I want to, I want to kind of just throw this out there to you that I believe the Bible shows us, 1 Corinthians 13 shows us as we dive in, that there's, a, there's a, a massive weight on your response when you're asked why. And, you know, not just what you feel like you're supposed to say when someone asks you why or what you're told to say. The genuine, like the authentic answer of your heart when someone asks you, why are you serving them? Why did you just pay for my gas? Why'd you, and not just on a serve day, just in general. Why did you just buy my meal? Why did you just, the answer that you really truly express when you're, when you're asked that question, there's an incredible weight on it. And in fact, I believe that we're going to see today, there's so much weight on that, that your answer to that question, your heart posture when you're asked that question, determines whether or not you serving really even matters. And that's, that's huge. But we're going to see that today, that there's a huge weight. And if, if I had to title today's talk, it might be what it is titled somewhere, I don't know, but other than just 1 Corinthians 13, uh, my title would be, What is your Why? And it's important for us to 
step back for us to assess what is the why behind our what? What is the why behind our action? What is the motive behind the things that we're doing? Not just serving, just our everyday life. What are our motives? Because it's deeper, it's deeper than just, oh, it's what I'm called to do. Oh, it's what I'm supposed to do. It's what I want. There's, there's something more to it. So like I said, we're going to open to 1 Corinthians 13. And so if you're there, awesome. If not, it's on the screen. So you're good anyway, right? Um, but 1 Corinthians 13 verses 1 through 3, it says this. If I speak in the tongues of angels, sorry, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And this, this passage, and it's going to go on and we're going to keep reading eventually, but it's put right after Paul had just listed all those spiritual gifts. And then Paul goes and he lists those spiritual gifts and he says, without love, it's nothing. And this chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, if you've been around church, people call it like the love chapter. And they always have that weird way that they say it too. Like, I don't know why we got to say it weird, but that's what, it, I mean, it's, it's talking about love. And that's what 1 Corinthians is known as, 1 Corinthians 13 is known as, but it's funny and it's something I want to spend some time talking about today is, what is love? I'm not going to start singing the song, but what, like truly, what is our definition of love? Uh, I, if you guys didn't know, I'm getting married this year, which is super exciting. Yeah. Um, you know, taking all donations, right? No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So I'm getting married this year. And I just, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking how funny it is. Like I could be, my fiance's name is Kira. I could be in a conversation with Kira talking about how much I love Mexican food, which I absolutely love Mexican food, right? And Three Amigos specifically, if you need a place like a Thousand Oaks local boy, born and raised, right? So that's Three Amigos is my spot. So I'd be talking about how much I love Three Amigos. I love my burritos at Three Amigos. And then in the, you know, like two seconds later, I tell Kira how much I love her. And it's like, but you, let's just think about that, right? I mean, that's how we talk. That's how that's our conversations, right? That's, we, we put love on everything. We use the word over and over and over again. And I'm just saying that because this morning, as we move forward, as we dive into a chapter talking about love, we need to have a definition that we, a working definition of it. And if you look at like political tension, right? I mean, we see it on the news, political tension, racial tension, all of these different things. You talk to people of all different backgrounds and beliefs and, and faith, faith systems, all these different things, you know, that everyone would agree on this point that love is the answer. We all need to love. Love is, love is the, the solution. Love is, which is great. But is the love that those people are talking about, that the world is always talking about, that we use all the time in our language, is it the same love that we see in scripture? Is it the same love? Because we use it the same, but we need to have a common definition. We need to know what we're talking about. We talk about these things. And so, like I said, 1 Corinthians uh, 12 lists all these spiritual gifts and, and we talked about them last week. And if they're meaningless without love, what is love? And so uh, in English, we don't do the word any justice, right? We have one word and we just have to make it work for everything. But in the Greek, in the original Greek language, there's all these different words for love. And I'm not going to go into all of them, but we're going to focus on the word agape. And agape is this word, this Greek word that was given to describe this specific type of love and it didn't exist before and they needed to generate a new word because the other loves that they, they had, it didn't, it, didn't quite, it didn't quite fit. And so agape is the fatherly love of God for humans as well as the human reciprocal love for God. God's agape love is unmerited, gracious, and constantly seeking the benefits of the ones he loves. And the crazy part about that as we read that definition as we move forward is that is the same love that scripture calls us to have as well. That level of love is the same one. And so if we look at the, the story, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 13, and then 14. 12 and 14 are both these chapters that dive really deep into spiritual gifts. And then right there conveniently placed in the middle, we have 13, talking about love. But as we begin to understand the level of love that it's talking about, you can't help but start to think, this love is a, this is a spiritual gift as well. I can't possibly obtain this level of love just on my own, just naturally, just willing myself into it. And so Paul conveniently places it for us right between these two chapters, talking about gifting 
and then talks about this greatest gift and the greatest gift being love. And so as we look at, look at that, it's good that we have this, this common definition and, the, and realize that there's a possibility for us to possess this level of love as followers of Jesus. And so in order to see like where, where are we at with our love? How are we loving people? How are we loving God? How are we doing these things? There has to be some sort of way in which we can check the temperature of our hearts, right? Take inventory of our hearts, see where we're at with these things. You know, I worked at In-N-Out for three years. Um, that was super cool. Not there anymore, but it's all good. Um, I, worked, I worked what's called the cleanup shift. Anyone familiar? Anyone In-N-Out people know what that is? Okay, so early in the morning, 5.30, I would, I would get there at five because I was so bought into the culture, right? But I would get there at five. That's what In-N-Out is, man. They just bring you in. I would get there at 5 a.m., and you know, you wonder why the burgers are so good because we're there at 5 a.m., we're cleaning stuff, we're doing things. And that was every morning. I did that for a number of years, the cleanup shift. And every morning, the manager for your store would come in and they'd have a clipboard and they'd take inventory. So they would take inventory of the stuff that we have. So, you know, they go up to the potatoes and they go to the lettuce and they go to these different things. And the idea was to take inventory. But if I was a manager, I'm taking inventory and I go to the potatoes and I see there's two bags of potatoes and I'm like, okay, two bags. And I just walk away. What did I just accomplish? Nothing. The, in order for me to take inventory, I need to know what's needed so I know what's missing. And so that's the idea that we're going to talk about today is that if we're going to take inventory of our hearts, inventory of our love, we need to know what's missing. We need to know what's needed so we could see what the gap is. We could see where it is that, that scripture is calling us to be and where we are at. And so 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 goes on and it says this. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always preserved. Man, this passage is listing some of the fruit of love, right? If you have love in your life, if you have the love of Jesus, what is the evidence in your life? What is the evidence in this? This is the evidence that love is patient, love is kind. There's some heavy hitters here, right? There's some big time things and it doesn't matter how long we've been walking with the Lord. You can read a passage like this and there's gonna be some areas that we're missing. There's gonna be some things. It does not keep record of wrong, does not. I mean, there's gonna be somewhere in there where you're like, man, there's, there's evidence here in my life of where I'm lacking love because that's, I don't have that kind of patience. I don't have that kind of, you know, kindness, these types of things. Um, and so that's what the point of this verse is. And I think something, I'll just, I, I think that people have, and you might, you run into people like this and this may be your story. People have trouble going to church. People have trouble, you know, dealing with Christians because they feel like there's this persona of perfection that we kind of hold up. And we, we have this pressure on us and we go to church and better have your best smile on and you better act like you don't have any issues in your life, but that's not what the scriptures are for. And we could read a passage like this in, in 1 Corinthians 13 and see, and it, it could speak to our soul like a mirror right back at us, showing us where we're missing at. Where, where are these points? Where is this areas that I'm lacking love? And what is the evidence of that in my life? That's what it's for. And, you know, if, if there's not an area in your life right now that you're wrestling with, that, that the Spirit's kind of prompting you in, hey, you need to work on this. You need to grow in this area. Then it's time to start looking back at the Word of God and holding it up as that mirror and being like, man, there's a standard here that I'm, I'm struggling to love in this way. Lord, would you help me to love in this way. And that's what it's for. And we're not supposed to always feel like we're supposed to be perfect. It's okay to read these verses and to read the Bible and be like, oh, this is tough. I don't know how I feel about this. I don't know if I like this. Man, this convicts me. That's the point. Dive into it. Allow it to speak to your soul like that. And we should be wrestling with those things. And so, like I said, that verse talks about the fruit that's being produced from the love within us. And then we look at Galatians 5, 22 through 23, and it says this, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. We know this verse. A lot of you probably know this verse. So that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. That's the evidence in your life. And it's this, this idea, right? Hey, I have the spirit living inside of me. Here's the fruit of it. I have the love of Jesus inside of me. If we go back to 1 Corinthians 13, here's the 
fruit of it. It's the evidence in our life. So you could, if you could say that, you know, the fruit in your life, the fruit of the love of Jesus in your life is, is loving, is serving, is kindness, is humility, is all these things. All these things are a result of what's already happening on the inside of us. They are an overflow, an overflow of what's going on inside of our heart. And Luke 6, 45 says this, the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Okay, I got an illustration for you. Hang on one sec. I need some like Jeopardy music or something. Just hang on. Thank you, I hear that. Okay, so I was going to do, do this illustration with water. And the tech team just lost it. They were like, if you bring water on that stage, you are never allowed at church again. I'm just kidding. They didn't say that. Okay, this is super simple. This is super simple, but I, I just want you to get a picture of something here. I just, I just need you to tell me when the cup is overflowing, okay? We're going we're gonna to do this together. Here we go. Oh, very good. Okay, there's some music there. Okay, great. Okay, now it's overflowing. I'm going to move this real quick before I create a huge mess. Wow, that was good. They actually put the Jeopardy music on. Jeez, that's awesome. What an incredible tech team we have. Okay. So, so what happened? The rice, it, in order for the rice to overflow out of the cup, the existing space had to be filled before. And so, so often we try and just, just artificially produce fruit in our life of love and joy and, and all these different things. We try and artificially produce it. And the only possible way that it's actually authentically produced is out of an overflow. But the overflow must be produced by the existing space being our hearts, being our souls, our relationship with Jesus being filled already. Right? The, the, the cup did not, the cup did not start over, didn't start overflowing until it was filled. We don't start overflowing until we are filled. And so often, one of the reasons that we burn out in, in ministry, in life, just in general, is you're pouring out from an empty cup. And I, I really believe there's some of you in here right now that are, feel like you're pouring out of an empty cup. And that just leaves you feeling dry and dry over and over and over again. You need to be filled. You need to go back to the source. You know, if we, we also need to understand just the, the, the level of love that we are being called to as Christians. When we, when we say Jesus style love, the level of love that we are being called to, if you look at John 15, 12, this is Jesus talking. He says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Right? To love, this is my buddy Corey right here. I love Corey. Corey's the best. To love Corey like Jesus loved him. Wow. I mean, that's a standard of love that is just insane. That is so far beyond our natural abilities, right? And then it goes on to say this in the next verse. It says, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. This is a love that we cannot will ourselves into. The love that we are being called to in scripture, the love that, it, that precedes us going out and serving and doing all these things is way outside of our natural abilities. And it's a kind of love that can only be produced out of an overflow of an existing feeling, right? Of a, of a feeling that already took place inside of us. The only way it can be produced. And I want to kind of set some of us free this morning. And I think that a lot of times we feel like in order to be a good person, in order to be loved by God, there's some sort of formula, right? There's some sort of things we could do. If I do more stuff, if I serve more, if I act better, if I cuss less, if I drink less, if I do all these things, I'll be loved by God more. And we see ourselves standing over here and God's over there. And there's this void between us and God. And we're like, man, I need to do all of these good works. And on the other side of all these good works, all these things I could do, then I can be loved by God. Then I can reach heaven. Then I can be closer to Jesus. That is contrary to the gospel. That is the opposite. What, what happened was there was a void that we could never cross. There was this gap that we could never cross. And Jesus, in his love, stepped down from heaven, crossed that gap, did the work that we could never do, lived the life we could never live. And our job now is not to just do a bunch of good things. It's to step into a personal intimate relationship with Jesus. And it is from love that we then go and work. Amen. It is from that place of being close to Jesus where we're filled up with that, then we can go out and work. And the, the, the idea is that when you're doing that, you're working 
from love, not for love. When you're working to obtain the love of Jesus, you're never quite going to get there because you were never designed that way. You were designed to be filled up with it, to work from love and go out from that space. And the idea is when we, when we work from love as opposed to for love, there's some things that we see that take place in our life. And so I want to talk about two things that will happen when we work from love instead of for love. The first one being that working from love will never leave you feeling inadequate. And this is what I mean by that. This last serve day, like I said, I didn't get to do the gas station one, but I did, a, I did an awesome one. Uh, I went to the apartment complex just right over here and we gave out $50 Target gift cards. We just knocked on doors, uh, went led by the Lord, gave out gift cards. And I'll be honest, most of the reactions that I had from those people I mean, they weren't that special, right? They'd come up to the door, they'd be like, cool, like I can go get the whole Magnolia section from Target, you know, Chip and Joanna, right? Here I come. So, or, or something like that, whatever you like from Target. And, and so that was a lot of the reactions. And so the, the point of what I'm trying to make here is that if the outcome of the situation being the reaction that I got from the person at the door, if that was what determined the victory, I would have been feeling inadequate a lot of the times. Like I didn't qu quite do good enough. But the difference is, the victory was received on the other side of even knocking on the door. I was going from love to the door to where that person in the team that I was with, they could have someone call them a name, tell them whatever they wanted to. They already received the victory by receiving the love of Jesus. But when we're trying to work for some sort of result, we're trying to work for some sort of outcome, and then we get our victory, then we're loved by God, whatever it may be, you're going to fall short. You're not going to quite reach the, the, the place that you want to reach. And that's the difference is being filled up before you go but recognizing how loved you are before you go and then you're in that relationship with Jesus, it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what the world tells you, right? It doesn't matter what people think about you because you're working from a place of victory. You know who you are. You know what your identity is and you're set in that. The second thing is that working from love allows us to experience the fullness of what God has in store. And so this is big. Um, can you love and show love and serve and do good things without a relationship with Jesus? Yes. Can you have fun? Can you have happiness? Can you have joy without a relationship with Jesus? Yes. Can you have a successful marriage? Can you have kids? Can you have, yes, you can. You can. Outside of a relationship with Jesus, yes, you can. But here's the difference. Outside of a relationship with Jesus, on all of those things that you experience in life, joy, serving, whatever relationships, whatever it may be, there will always be a governor on those things. And so those of you that are not familiar with what a governor is, I'm not talking about Gavin Newsom. Um, he may be a little too involved in that. I don't know. I'm not going to get into the politics of that, but I'm not talking about Gavin Newsom. With motorcycles and with cars, like I want to really ride a motorcycle. That's my dream is to have a street bike, but my family's like never, right? Because they knew that I would get one that can go 150 miles an hour. But if I were to get a 150 mile an hour bike and I'm like, man, I don't want to kill myself on this bike, I could put on it what's called a governor. You can do the same on a car. And what that does is it limits the capabilities of the motor. So as opposed to going 150, the top speed would be 60, 70, 80, whatever it's set to be. There's a limitation on it. When we operate in life outside of a relationship with Jesus, yes, you can experience things, but they will never be fulfilling because there's a limitation on how much you can experience that life. Right? In, in John 10, 10, Jesus says, I have come that you would have life and have it to the full. And that word, and some of you guys know that word, we've, we've done series, whole series on that word, is Zoe life. And it's a God kind of life. It's the fullness that life has to offer from within a relationship with Jesus. And that doesn't mean there's not struggle. That doesn't mean there's not pain. That doesn't mean there's not really tough things that happen in life. But what it means is that from that place of love, you can experience the fullness of, of joy. You can experience the fullness of these relationships, the fullness of the things that God has to offer. But that's the difference in working from love and for love. When you're working for love and you're working outside of that intimate relationship with Jesus, it, it's never to the full potential of what you could possibly be, possibly be, what you could possibly achieve, be achieving, the level of the intimacy with Jesus that you could possibly have. It has to come from that relationship with Jesus. And so I need you to kind of track with me here. So without love, we establish this, without love, our giftings, the things we do for the church, just the things we do in life, right? Just being a good person, doing all these things. What did that, what did that 
thing said, we, that passage in the beginning, verse three out of that passage says, if I give all I possess to the poor, I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. We could do all of these things and it could still miss the whole point. It could still not have meaning. It could still gain nothing. You could, I mean, that's a, that's a crazy thought. You could give over your body to hardship and still without love, you gain nothing. And so without love, our relationships are not at their full potential. You cannot be the person that you want to be to those around you without that love. And so what we're saying is that love is the prerequisite for your relationships, for everything in life. It's a prerequisite for your purpose. And in fact, I'll go as far as to say, love is the point of your life. And we're going to, discuss, we're going to discover that here. But we also established today and this morning that this level of love, this agape love, this Jesus style, all in, no strings attached, self-sacrificial kind of love is not something we can naturally obtain, right? We established that, that it's, it's outside of our capabilities. It's outside of our understanding. So how, how, how is this possible? How can we have this definition of love, this type of love, this agape love that is outside of our understanding, but that's the love we need for our actions and our serving and our life to be worth it. And the, the way that that works is that love you can only express out of being personally filled in a personal relationship with Jesus. And we've been talking about that. But it comes from sitting with Jesus. It comes from knowing him deeply, reading his word, praying to him, allowing him to speak to your soul. It is from that place that you can then, as we talked about, it's this gifting of love. You can then have this supernatural filling of love that overflows into all the other areas of your life. And so the whole point of what God is trying to show us is that we need to draw near to him in order to be filled up with his love. And we need to be, essentially, we need to be at our source. We need to know where our source is at. We had a situation, kind of funny, uh, in the youth room, the very back youth room, this past Sunday, last week, and it was freezing cold. They were going to have, like, a bunch of kids were going to be there in there really soon. All the lights were out. And I had these space heaters because the heater was, I had all these space heaters that I was like plugging into the different outlets, trying to get some heat to the room so that the kids weren't freezing in there. None of them were working. And so two men, much wiser, much smarter than me, Josiah and Mike, they decide, wow, we should check the breaker, right? I never thought of that. Okay. And they go to the breaker and they flip the breaker boom, everything's on, the heater's on, lights are on, everyone's happy, we're partying, right? So, but it, what had to happen was they had to go to the proper source. You know, I, I was, all the sources I was checking were not the proper source. They had to go to the proper source. And that's the whole point of what it is. Our source needs to be in the right place. And that's what, what I'm trying to say. Uh, if you look at the life of Jesus, those of you that are familiar, that have read the gospels, read about the life of Jesus, and if you haven't, Jesus would preach to the masses, or he would teach to his, just to his group of disciples, or he would heal the sick, or he would do all these crazy things that we all, these amazing things that we hear Jesus doing. But what would he do every single time, early in the morning or late at night, he would go meet with his father. He would, I mean, every time, right? You look at this, he would go and he'd, he would sneak away to the quiet place. He would sneak away to sit with his father. What is he doing? Even Jesus is constantly checking his source. He's constantly making sure that his source is in the right place because he knows that there's all these things God wants to do in his life. And we know that there's all these things that God wants to do in our life. And if you don't know it, I'll tell you that there's all these things God wants to do in your life, but you got to get to the source. You got to hear from him. You got to be filled up from the right place to know what it is and where it is that God is leading you. And we see Jesus do that in his life. That before he would make decisions, before he would, I mean, there's, there's instances where he's preaching to all these people. There's all these healings happening. It's super great. And he would go and meet with his father. He would go get alone with God. And then the next day he tells his disciples, hey, we're actually leaving. And they're like, what? That doesn't make sense. But if we want to make the type of faith decisions that don't make sense, it comes from the assurance of meeting with Jesus in private and knowing what it is that he's speaking to us, knowing how he's filling us up, knowing where he's leading us and checking our source. And so uh, there's two ways, there's two ways that we can make sure that our source is in the right place. The first one is you got to check your diet. And so as a church, I'm just going to, we're just going to go all keto. I just, we're just going to make a decision. 
I'm just kidding. That was a terrible joke. No, we're not, not, not your, not your food diet. It's the diet, it's the diet of your heart. It's what is your heart taking in? What are you allowing yourself to, to ingest into your heart and into your soul? You got to check it. You got to look at it. Uh, Pastor Jim gave a message a while back, if you guys remember about like, what are you soaking in? Because the, the truth is that, you know, it doesn't, it, it, even if it's not, if it's not the word of God, even if it's not your prayer time, your heart is soaking something in, right? Even if you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping something. There's always something that is, that is filling you up. And it's either, it's either Jesus or it's not. And so we need our source to be in the right place because very easily the world, the world wants to fill you up with all these different things. There's lots, lots of attacks, that things that want to get into your heart, they want to infiltrate your life and take you in different directions. And so you got to know what is filling me up. Where, what am I allowing to fill me up? And some of the simple things, right? It could be, what we're listening to, you know, who we're around, what we're allowing to have influence on our lives, the things we're watching. I mean, it's, it's different for every single one of us. And that's something that in your own time with the Lord and, and just praying and just, what, what, is, what, is, what am I building? What are the walls I'm building up around my heart that are preventing the love of God from getting in? What are the things I'm allowing my heart to soak in and being like, Jesus, I don't want to soak in those things anymore. And we, we read that verse, right? It's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. So it really, really, really matters where your heart is at and what your heart is soaking in. That's the first way we check our source or make sure our source is in the right place is checking our diet. And the second one, and this one is, I mean, as I talked about in the beginning, this message is not just like, you know, I'm just gonna talk to you guys. I mean, this is, this is for me. This is my story. This is my life. And I'm, I'm, I'm teaching to myself. But uh, the second one is we need to make space for Jesus. And this is kind of where we're going with this whole thing. In Luke 10, verses 38 through 42, it's a passage that some of you may be familiar with, but it says this. As Jesus and his, and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was, was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work for myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. I said this before, that this, I mean, this is my story. And, I, and, I, and this is maybe for some of you, you're constantly, and we're constantly running around trying to do all these things. Maybe for Jesus, maybe it's just to be a good person. Maybe it's to achieve our goals, whatever it may be. There, where there's constantly something in, in the world that we live in today that has our attention. There's constantly something that we're doing. Uh, and like I said, it could be for the Lord. I mean, there's all these things that can take our attention. And we see Martha doing those things. And she's making preparations for the Lord. I mean, Jesus is at her house. I would be making the house look pretty good, right? I'm not great at cleaning, but I would be then, right? I mean, Martha's like, she's getting after it. But who does Jesus say is in the right space? It's Mary. It's just sitting at his feet. Just recognizing that in the midst of the chaos of life, in the midst of the chaos of the preparations, in the midst of all the things going on, yes, there's times to work and yes, there's times to do things for the Lord and to serve, but there needs to be a filling first. And she recognized that. Man, I need to sit at the feet of Jesus. I need to be filled up first. And Jesus tells Martha, this will not be taken from her. This time that she spends at my feet, this time that she spends soaking in what I have to say from her, will, for her, will not be taken from her. And so we need to, you know, spend time, this is just super simple, is, is spending time making space to get quiet with the Lord. And this could be a foreign concept to a lot of us and some of you that have been a part of our 21 days of prayer. This is what we're doing. And it's, and it's awkward to spend time in silence or spend time listening to worship or spend time reading the Bible. You're like, man, I hate reading the Bible. Okay, well, if you keep doing it, you see the necessity that it has for your life. And we talk to our youth group about this all the time. And like, oh, you wanna, you gotta read more. You gotta pray more. But the truth is, that if you see the necessity that soaking in the presence of Jesus has on your heart, if you recognize that necessity, or at least you have a taste of it, you're like, I know there's something there that I want. It's never gonna happen unless we make space for it. And Mary had to make a conscious decision in that moment to make space to sit at the feet of Jesus. And we have to do the same thing. I believe there's a, there's a lesson that's really there for us in that story of a pattern of life that we need to take, that we need to make that space. And like I said before, life is crazy. Life is busy. We do lots of things and it can lead to us pouring out of an empty cup. If we're not watching our source, if we're not taking the temperature, if we're not looking and taking inventory constantly and using the word of God to 
be that inventory. And I think sometimes, and I've seen it in my life, I've seen it in other people's lives, we have, we talk about like walls and, and, and pride and things that are built up that prevent us from actually having a change in the way we live. Right? Because it's like, it's, we don't want to, we want to act like we have it figured out. I talked about the persona of perfection. It's, you know, the, the, the whole idea of the kingdom of God is that it's flipped on its head. It's the people that are down low, that are lifting other people up. It's the people that are willing to be humble, willing to, willing to step low, that others will be lifted high. Those are the people that Jesus is saying they're in the right spot. And so whatever it takes for you to get before the Lord and for you to spend that time alone with Jesus, you know, it's admitting, you know, admitting that you need help or whatever that may be, admitting that you need to change some of the patterns of your life. There's breaking down those walls of pride and just stepping into a relationship with Jesus in humility. That is what Jesus is looking for. And so I want to return to our core passage one more time. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. I'm going to read it again. It says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all knowledge, and, and all knowledge, and I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. We see something here, right? We see these supernatural giftings, these giftings that we have are, they mean nothing without that love, without that prerequisite of love. But there's a, there's a reality that we could do all of these things to be a good person. We could do all of these things to get closer to God, to be loved by God more. And you could still stand before him one day and you could still say, son, daughter, you missed the whole point. You missed the whole point. And I, we don't want to miss the whole point. And the, the, the whole point is that if you look at the story of the Bible from beginning to end, and this fact just wrecked me and, and, and changed my life, is the fact that you look at a God who has spent all of eternity chasing us down for just for us individually. To have a personal, intimate relationship with each one of us individually for Him to be where we go to get filled up. That's the whole picture of it. That's the picture that Jesus doesn't want us to miss. And that's the picture that's being painted through the scriptures is that your source, if your source is gonna be love, you have to go to the author and the creator of love. And you have to spend time allowing that love to be what fills you up because there's lots of love in the world. There's lots of things that are gonna wanna fill you up in the world. And so it's essential, especially in a time like this, that we're a church that has our source in the right place. And his love for us, like we said, is so far outside of our understanding, is so far outside of our comprehension or our natural abilities. But if we can grab onto it, if we can make it what's overflowing out of us, we will be the church that loves radically, that serves radically, that the church that this world so desperately needs. So as we wrap up in worship, the prayer team is going to be up here at the stage. They're the most awesome people ever. Um, and there's an opportunity during worship, you know, if, if you're, you're feeling that stirring in your heart, you're allowing that, that pride to kind of to come down and to be like, man, I've been pouring out from an empty cup. And I felt that this morning that there's someone here that has really been pouring out of an empty cup. You need a fresh feeling of love. You need a fresh feeling of his spirit and, and allow the prayer team to, to pray over you, to partner with you, let them into the situation that you have going on and don't go on any longer in that way. That is not how Jesus wants you to keep moving forward. There's also an opportunity that if, if this is something you've never experienced, you've never stepped into a relationship with Jesus. You've never allowed him to enter into your soul and show you where you're missing and show you the life that he wants you to live. You've never stepped into that personal relationship. Come up to the prayer team as well and talk to them about that. There's not this persona of perfection that you need to have in the church. Let those walls fall down. Get to the feet of Jesus and just see what it is that he has to speak for your soul, speak to your soul. Um, I'm gonna pray us out and then we're gonna go into a time of worship and remember the prayer team will be up here. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you that, that you desire nearness to us. We thank you for the level of love that you've called us to, Father. We cannot reach it on our own. We cannot be there on our own. And so we just want to recognize in this moment that there's a level of life that you're calling us to that can only be obtained by just sitting with you and being filled completely with your love and with your presence. And so we just ask that in worship that you would just, you would fill this, this space, that you would fill us up individually, that we would go out from this place overflowing, recognizing the areas that we're missing, recognizing the areas that we need to grow in love, that we need to grow nearer to you. And that throughout this week, we would make more space for you, Lord. And for those that are in here that are pouring out from an empty cup, would they, would they seek the filling that only comes from sitting at your feet? Would they seek the filling that only comes from your presence and from your love and from a love encounter with you, Jesus? 
So we love you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that it's a mirror for our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in today to another great message from Atmosphere Church. If this message is spoken to your heart, would you take a moment and share it with your friends? You can connect with us on Spotify, iTunes, podcast, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Simply do a search for Atmosphere Church through these various platforms and then click the follow or subscribe button. If you're watching this video on YouTube, you should see it right below this video. It's another great way for us to be able to stay connected with you. If you live in the Southern California area, we would love to invite you to be part of our family. For more information about our church, go to our official webpage at atmosphere.church. Finally, if this service and our other resources bless you, would you consider giving back to Atmosphere Church to support not only these things, but also support the creation of even more resources for you? To make a donation, simply go to our website and click on the tab that says Give. Your gift of any amount is greatly appreciated. Until next time, we pray that you will keep the faith, spread the hope, and live the love.